Hello, thank you so much for having me here today. It's really an honor to speak with the group regarding homium laser nucleation of the prostate. I wanna talk with you about the techniques and outcomes and things that you can do to maximize your surgeon's experience uh, in the operating room when performing the procedure. As most of you are probably aware, HOLUP, which stands for homium laser nucleation of the prostate, is really a simple prostatectomy. So we are removing about 85 to 90% of the prostate by coring out the inner portion of it. We're leaving the outer, outer capsule intact. But unlike a simple prostatectomy, when we used to open the abdomen and take the adenoma out as one big large piece, we're doing this all through the natural orifice of the urethra and using a scope and removing the tissue with morselation. Same end result, just less invasive and faster recovery. Uh, the indications for HOLUP are vast. It's basically any man with significant urinary tract symptoms secondary to BPH. There's no size limit, despite what you may have heard. Some people think there's prostates that are too small or too big. Actually, that that is just not true. So the biggest prostate I've ever done, I took out 487 grams. I think the pre-op imaging was around 600, but the tissue weighed 487 grams when I got it out. And the least I've ever taken out was one gram. It was a small prostate, needed to take out the median bar and they were fine. So anyone can benefit from the procedure. Because it has such a wide array of indications, the workup is pretty minimal. So I always want to assess their symptoms objectively. I get an IPSS score, a SHIM score to assess their erections, and a Michigan incontinence score to assess their incontinence. About 30% of men will have some degree of incontinence before surgery. Um, they, they have urge, urge incontinence, they have dribbling, they have overflow. So it's good to document that before you even start. I often will get an ultrasound residual to assess how well they're emptying. And if I can, if their bladder is full, when they come to the office, we'll get a Euroflow. I always want to rule out prostate cancer in men who are of an age where they would undergo treatment. You know, an 88 year old man, we're not going to worry about this so much, but a 60 year old man who may benefit better from a radical prostatectomy of cancer is causing this, uh, as opposed to a hole up, we definitely want to do the PSA. If the PSA is elevated, we get an MRI, always do a rectal exam. If it's abnormal, I get an MRI and then a biopsy as needed. I want to make sure there's no infection. So I get a urinalysis and culture. I do not get urodynamic studies. Maybe twice a year, I get a urodynamic study if I'm concerned about an underlying neurologic problem. And I only perform cystoscopies if I'm concerned about stricture disease. So a really young patient or someone who's had multiple prior surgeries, I want to evaluate the urethra first. Holop can be performed with a wide variety of scope sizes. So, you know, in Brazil, they've got the 22 French. You can actually do it with a 22 French store scope, but you can't morselate with 22 French in the United States because you have to have that five millimeter working channel. So the smallest scope available is the 24 French from Wolf in the United States that you can both enucleate and morselate. I'd say the vast majority of surgeons use a 26 French scope. And then there's some outliers like me who use 28 French scopes because we're mainly doing extremely large prostates and we want the flow. Regardless of the size, you need something that will stabilize the catheter. So, or stabilize the laser fiber. I put the laser fiber through a catheter and then I put it through the stabilizing ring, which you see going off in the video up here in the corner. Um, and that's because a homium laser has such vibration to it. Your, your laser fiber will be going everywhere if you don't have something to stabilize it. This is my back table because I use a 28 French scope. I use a lot of uh, lubricant to dilate the urethra. I'm going to use sequential Van Buren sounds to do that. If the meatus is tight, I may even cut the meatus with an Otis urethrotome. It's very important that the urethra is loose around the scope, regardless of the size of scope that you're using. And then I have the scope in place and I let the prostate tell me how to do the procedure. 
So if there's only two lateral lobes, I will do a six o'clock cut down the middle. If there's a small median lobe, I might do an offset cut to incorporate that lobe into one of the lateral lobes. And if there's a large median lobe, I'm going to be making two cuts and take the median lobe out separately. So this is a large median lobe that I'm showing here. And I'm going to start at the bladder neck and cut all the way from the bladder neck back to the viru at the seven o'clock position. Now it's gonna take quite a bit of time to actually get down to the capsule, multiple passes over and over again through this tissue to get to what I call the capsule, which is this smooth looking tissue you can see. When the laser starts fluffing up tissue, that's adenoma, but when it stops doing that fluffiness and you just see a slick wall that maybe has some blood vessels in it, that's the capsule and that's right here. I use two joules and 20 hertz or two joules and 20 hertz for uh, coagulation and two joules and 50 hertz for cutting. Once I've made the cut at the five and the seven o'clock position, I'm going to join those two cuts with an upside down U or a frown incision, whatever you wanna call it, just proximal to the Viru Montana. So I'm con collect connecting the five o'clock cut and the seven o'clock cut, again, using that two joules and 50 Hertz. And then this will allow the tissue to just naturally roll up over the top of the adenoma. So as that tissue rolls up over the top of the scope, sorry, not adenoma scope, um, you're gonna see that it will naturally go on traction, counter traction. This is the easiest part of the surgery. And this is what I usually have the residents and fellows start with. The scope is putting it on traction, the laser's dissecting in that beautiful line, that plane that you see, and the tissue naturally rolls into the bladder. I go in, I look for the ureteral orifice, and then I cut the urethelium off, moving lateral to medial. If I keep moving just straight posterior, I'm going to roll that tissue onto the back wall of the bladder and cut the bladder. So once it rolls up, you want to start cutting in from lateral to medial on both sides to release the median lobe. Once the median lobe's released, then I do the apical turn. So I incise the urethelium just lateral to the Viru Montanum. And then I put the scope in the pocket and then I twist around the apex. So in this case, I'm going from six o'clock to nine o'clock, trying to get all the way up to 12 o'clock position. I've lowered my laser energy here. I use two joules and 20 Hertz when I'm working around the apex. And then I cut that bunched up urethelium just to release it from the sphincter muscle. This by far and away is the most difficult part of the surgery, developing the apical plane. If they do this right, the rest of the case will go extremely well. But I'm just constantly and slowly working my way up to that 12 o'clock position. Now I do it on the other side. I go lateral to the Viru Montanum, I incise the urethelium, I stick the scope in the pocket, and then I twist around the apex using a lower energy of two joules and 20 hertz. I'm going to push the adenoma away from the capsule, and then I'm circling around the apex, gently releasing the attachments. Some people think this is a real hard push, and it's actually quite gentle. If you're in the right plane, it will release naturally on its own and then I cut that strip. So I've now connected the two planes around the apex. The apex is completely released. So this is a, a, a schematic of what I just did. I basically just cut the urethelium away from the apex of the prostate, and I release the adenoma in that location. Now that the apex has been released, I need to develop the anterior plane. So I have the adenoma below me, capsule above me, and I'm working the scope from left to right and advancing forward towards the bladder neck. As I get closer to the bladder neck, you can see that I encounter these up and down fibers. This is perfect plane here. We call this the baleen of the prostate. These are the bladder neck muscle fibers that um, are attaching the adenoma to the bladder mucosa. So we're gonna go right through the middle of those. And as we do that, it's not uncommon to encounter blood vessels. So I'm going to cut through the tissue at two joules and 50 Hertz. And then I control the bleeding blood vessels at two joules and 20 Hertz as they're encountered. 
Um, once I make it into the bladder, now I'm going to take down the lateral walls of the bladder neck. You want to really take those down so that you make room to advance the adenoma into the bladder. Once I've created the anterior plane, now I just divide the lobes into half. So I go back into the true lumen, turn my scope upside down, and then I cut from the true lumen up to the plane that I created to create two separate prostate lobes. You don't have to do this. I think it's easier if you do this because you are working with smaller pieces of tissue. So it's easier to deposit it into the bladder. And then once I have the two lobes divided, now I just go to work on each lateral lobe. So I'm just showing both lobes at once, but you obviously would do it one at a time. I come back towards the apex and I work the lateral lobe um, all the way out as I roll it towards the bladder neck. It's really important to keep your planes all together. Some people work posterior and then anterior, then lateral. And you really kind of want to move through all three planes at once. That will make the surgeon much more efficient because um, they're not creating false planes. And then the tissue will just eventually roll itself into the bladder and then you release it from the urothelial mucosa. So this can be a, a very long surgery or this can be a very short surgery depending on how efficient you are with your surgical techniques. And once we're done with the enucleation, now it's time for hemostasis. You should not go directly to morselation without performing some level of hemostasis. I will spend you know, five, 10, 15 minutes just drying up the fossa if there is any active bleeding. Anything that's red can bleed. So I'm going to run my laser at two joules and 20 hertz over this urothelial surface until I can turn off the flow of the um, scope as I'm doing here, and I do not see any active bleeding. Now it's safe to morselate. You want really great visualization before you do that. And then here is morselation. This is the image you ideally want. It's not always possible, but ideally you want crystal clear when you morselate. The big key take home is, is you have to have two inflows. So what I do is I will take the main inflow off the scope and I put it on the outflow port of the scope. Then I put the offset nephroscope in or your morsoscope is what you would use with Wolf into that outer sheath. And then I add another inflow line. So I have two main inflows with no outflow. The only outflow comes from the morselator itself. If you don't have the two main inflows, you're going to have the bladder slowly collapsing and then it will eventually end up in the jaws of your morselator. And that is not what you want. So extra inflow, if it's on gravity, you're not gonna perforate the bladder, let it drain and use the morselator to morselate. I think this is the biggest mistake I see is that people try to put an outflow port on the, the nephroscope or the morsoscope and the bladder slowly collapses and then they get into trouble. So just two inflows, that's the key. And I actually use one inflow, which has two bags and then another inflow that has one bag. So there's actually three bags of saline running together through two lines. Well, let's just get to the point of bladder injury. I think it's the most dreaded complication of HOLIP, but honestly, it doesn't happen that often. It's uncommon, usually occurs during morselation, and most of these are superficial. If you think about what we do to a bladder in a TURBT where we're resecting bladder tumor, it's generally not nearly as severe as that. Uh, significant injuries occur about 0.1 to 4% of the time, depending on the surgeon's experience. And most of them are managed with, it, with a catheter if it's retroperitoneal and there's very little prostate tissue left. If it's intraperitoneal, then that's a different story and you may have to open and repair it. Um, or if there's significant adenoma and you have to do a lot more morselating to get it out. Most people try to morselate as much as they can in the fossa to prevent this, but it still happens on occasion. And this is just a morselator injury that we caught in the OR at Northwestern. So the fellow was morselating and he did not notice that a new nurse had come into the room and clicked off two of the water bags. 
um, thinking that he didn't need all three running. So the bladder sucked into the blades. Now we had really good visualization. So we saw it happen. So we didn't panic. What we actually did is we disassembled the morselator externally at the scope. We took the handpiece off, we took the suction off, and that allowed the blades to release without tearing the tissue. And you can see that this is actually extremely superficial. Um, it didn't even get through the muscle, it's just the urethelium. So I was able to clean up the edges with the laser to make sure it didn't bleed, which it really wasn't bleeding. And we still took this person's catheter out the same day. So if you have good visualization and you catch it and you don't panic, that's when you can salvage the situation by externally deassembling the morselator. Don't pull the morselator into the scope and pop that tissue off. That will create a big hole, but just stop and externally disassemble the morselator and it will release the tissue. What about beach balls? Well, beach balls were really common with the luminous morselator. Really just a nightmare of a situation that you dealt with quite often, but it's not very common with the wolf morselator. And I see it more often um, in patients where they've been on 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride, dutasteride for many, many years. So this is a case where I'd been morselating about an hour and I still have these perfectly round beach balls that I just couldn't get rid of. I pulled them back into the prostatic fossa. I pushed the, uh, the morselator blade back to the capsule and keep in the lowest possible position, which will often work, but it still would not morselate. So I put the laser scope back in and then turning my flow down, I cut grooves into the adenoma. By cutting the grooves into the adenoma, I've now created an edge that the morselator can catch on to. You've got to put a lot of grooves in and you have to go much deeper than you think you need to. Um, so put a lot of grooves into that adenoma and then switch back to your morselator and it will eventually be able to grab those edges and morselate the tissue. I probably, I do about 600 holdups a year. I have to do this two times a year. Not very common with your morselator, but I'm, I'll tell you when it happens, it's really frustrating. And this is a trick that will work. If this doesn't work, then what you can do, put a catheter in, run continuous bladder irrigation overnight. It softens up the adenoma. Try morselating again tomorrow. But I haven't really done that since the luminous days. So um, this should work, do the trick. After you're done morselating, put your catheter in. This is what the color of the urine should be like. Maybe a little redder, but you know, this is a perfect case. You can tolerate a little bit redder, but it shouldn't be bright red like a TERP or um, other surgical procedures. After the patient gets up and walks around, it probably would look a little more something like this, and that's totally acceptable. And then this is what the fossa looks like one year after surgery. Nice, wide open, no adenoma left to regrow, and that's why HOLA lasts so long. So I had briefly brought up the different size scopes, you know, and we did a study at Northwestern comparing my 28 French scope versus the 24 French scope. And it was a prospective randomized trial of 152 patients. We only included prostates that were 200 cc's or less in the study. Um, bigger prostates, you know, have unique challenges of more bleeding and need better flow. So we chose 200 and less. And you can tell by the graph here that there's no difference in comorbidities or preoperative characteristics between patients in either group. Um, we found that there was really no statistical difference in enucleation efficiency, morselation efficiency, or procedural times between the 20 and 24 French. However, we did have improved rates of same-day discharge because of less bleeding in the 28 French group, 94% versus 82% in the 24 French group. And they had a shorter length of stay with a larger scope, um, seven hours versus 12 hours in the 24 French. And the surgeon uh, graded visualization was better in the 28 French too, it's just better flow. There was no difference in ER presentation, 90 day complications, 
um, or post-operative functional outcomes such as incontinence. And these patients got a daily survey after the procedure to assess their incontinence. So we concluded that larger scopes were probably helpful in facilitating uh, same-day trial avoid. Um, they're definitely more beneficial when the surgeon is early in their learning curve and they need that good visualization so that they can see and figure out what they're doing. Um, we didn't see any benefits in the early stages. Now we're going to do the two-year follow-up to see if there's any difference in stricture or bladder neck contractures between the groups. So maybe that will be different. Um, but I do feel like the 24 French has a role for the advanced practitioner to use in patients who have had prior strictures, those with a penile prosthesis or small prostates. I think it may be beneficial there. With the 24 French scope, just to go back, the inflow cannot keep up with the morselator if you're morselating for a long period of time. So if you're gonna morselate over just a few minutes, you need to stop every so often, allow the bladder to refill with fluid and then start morselating again. So it's kind of a stop and stop, a stop and start with morselation as opposed to a just continuous morselation if a larger prostate is going to be used. I talked a little bit earlier about the great outcomes of HOLUP, but how do we know that? Well, since HOLUP was introduced in the late 90s, there has been over 500 studies by now on the procedure. It has had more comparative studies, randomized clinical control trials, and meta-analyses than any other surgical procedure to date. And it's been compared to TERP, Greenlight, Thula, Robotic Simple, Open Simple, and universally has been found to be superior with regards to catheterization time, hospitalization time, long-term improvements in symptoms, and bleeding. We call it the platinum standard. And this is just one of the meta-analysis that I really liked that compared HOLUP to TERP. It looked at over 600 patients and looked at outcomes. And you can see that HOLUP outperformed TERP in, in almost every category, including blood transfusion rate, recatheterization rate, and stricture rates. It was lower in HOLUP. But what I really like this study is that it shows that the incontinence rates are not higher with HOLUP than TERP. So if you do a good job and you remove tissue, you're going to have a transient level of incontinence in a certain percentage of patients that will resolve long-term. In fact, in this study, the only place where TERP was faster than a HOLUP was an operative time. And I would say that these studies probably had the old morselator and the old laser. And if we repeated it today, it wouldn't be faster than a HOLUP. The long-term outcomes of HOLUP, though, I think is what really shines. This study was from El Halali in Canada, and he was one of the first people in the world to do HOLUP after Peter Gilling. And he had almost 1,500 patients that were followed in a prospective HOLUP database. At last follow-up, which was 18 years for most of the cohort, uh, they found that the PSA had remained low over that time period. Urethral stricture rate was 1.4%, and most of those occurred within the first year. Similarly, bladder neck contracture rate was 2% in within the first two years, but repeat holdup at 18 years follow-up occurred in 1.4% of the cohort. And most of those prostates were small, and most of those procedures were performed in the surgeon's learning curve. So realistically, if a patient has a holdup, it's an extremely low chance that they're going to need medication or surgery again, given how effective the procedure is. But I want to let you know that all enucleation is not the same. So with current laser technology with um, pulse modulation or MOSIS, we get great dissection with very little bleeding, excellent hemostasis. However, thulium is not the same. So I have actual a thulip up here. So true thulium laser, and you can see there's massive charring. You don't really see a plane. You're just coring out some tissue, um, but you aren't having any bleeding. And then I have a TFL hole up that I personally did. That is a lot of charring. Again, I'm kind of making up a plane. It's much slower. So yes, you can do a hole up with a thulium laser, which you don't see much of in the United States or TFL, which you see a lot of in the United States. 
but it's not the same surgery. Yes, it's hemostatic, but it is leaving tissue behind. And I think we'll see that um, with the retreatment rates will be higher. But because our current laser is so hemostatic, we are seeing that we can send patients home the same day. So this is a study that we did looking at our same day catheter removal and discharge pathway at Northwestern. And we found that in patients that were good candidates, meaning that they did not have a lot of comorbidities, that they uh, lived fairly close and had someone at home that could be with them that night, that out of 192 patients that we tried to remove their catheter and send them home, 10% could not urinate and had to spend the night. We looked at multiple predictors, including time of day, comorbidities, anticoagulation, amount of tissue removed, morselation time, and none of those items predicted why they couldn't urinate. Just about 10% of patients can't urinate from the anesthetic after the procedure and need the catheter put back in and we remove it the next day. So these are very good success rates, very high rates, and patients love getting their catheter out the same day. Um, I would say nowadays, almost every patient I see is anticoagulated. And this was an earlier study we did in 2021 where we looked at our pulse modulation laser and our patients who were anticoagulated and compared them to controls. And we found that um, most, almost all of these patients had discontinued their anticoagulation at the time of surgery. And we found that there was no difference in outcomes between uh, groups. We had no increase in transfusion rates. Uh, we had no increase in um, hospitalization time or um, catheterization time, but we did see that the 90 day complication rate was pretty high. It was around 27.7% in the anticoagulation group. We just looked at our data at Northwestern um, this week for the AUA abstracts, and we found that our complication rate, again, is still around 30% for 90 days. Um, we found that there's no difference if you continue anticoagulation versus discontinue it. These patients are just complicated, and sometimes they have problems. But the good news is, is you can get them through the surgery. You can get it done. You can get them back on their feet. And sometimes it goes extremely well. This is a patient whose INR was almost three. They were they had low platelets. We did it uh, the procedure with a hole up, and this is the color of their urine at the end of the case. So it is hemostatic. It does work, but these patients are just complicated. So to make our same day discharge work, this is our pathway. So we communicate with the anesthesia team. We ask for no intraoperative use of narcotics or muscle relaxants, and we prefer a LMA for their anesthetic. So a laryngeal mask anesthetic, so not a full breathing tube. We use the laser to dissect and we avoid blunt dissection because using the laser to dissect actually improves hemostasis. If you're pushing and tearing, you're gonna have more bleeding. I coagula coagulate the vessels in real time, and then I perform aggressive hemostasis of the prostate before and after morselation. In the recovery room, again, you have to communicate, avoid narcotics. We don't want these patients getting narcotics for bladder discomfort in the PACU. They can have Toradol or Ketorolac that's perfectly safe. It's not gonna hurt anything. And then the patients must be up and ambulating within two hours of arrival to the PACU to get them up and moving. Um, we want run one three liter bag of continuous bladder irrigation in the PACU. And then if the urine color looks clear enough, we fill their bladder with uh, saline and remove the catheter. If it's still red, we'll run a second bag. And if they need the second bag, it's a lot of times it's just too red to decath and they need to spend the night with irrigation and try again tomorrow. So I give them two bags of ir irrigation before I call it but um, usually one bag is all you need if you're gonna be successful in the decaf. And there's downstream effects of sending patients home the same day. So we evaluated the economic cost to the hospital of 312 patients treated by one surgeon. That was me. <laughs> Um, and 192 were treated with pulse modulation, pulse modulated laser, and 120 were treated with a standard 120 watt laser. 
Um, the pulse modulated laser, of course, is more expensive and so are the fibers. So already we're in the hole in that group. But when we looked at their outcomes, there was no difference in readmission rates. However, the pulse modulated laser patients were far more likely to go home the same day than the standard 120Y. And that changed the game when it came to cost. So if you could send the patients home the same day, we actually made $840 on a Medicare patient. Um, and when you considered in the 90 day readmission rates, we still made $747 per patient just by being able to send them home. We cut out all that nursing cost, hospital room um, costs, medication costs, and we're able to safely send the patients home the same day. And it was a cost savings for the institution. Now that we can send patients home the same day, we're really in great competition with the other procedures out there that are considered minimally invasive or office-based, the missed procedures. If you looked at length of stay in the Eurolift studies, they actually were in the hospital one to 1.9 days and their mean catheterization time was one day. So um, definitely whole up competes with that. 45 to 58% required recatheterization once their catheter was removed, which is significantly higher than whole up. <clears throat> Resume, 90% of the patients had a catheter placed post-procedure, and most of them are catheterized for 3.5 days. Aquas, aqua ablation, mean catheterization times four days with the almost two days in the hospital. PAE does not require a catheter, but if you come in with a catheter, you're going to have it for two to three weeks. And it has a 4% rate of acute urinary retention after the procedure. So definitely does better than PAE as well. And when you talk about long-term cost effectiveness, Holup also does extremely well. Right out of the gate within the first year, Resume is the cheapest procedure, least amount of cost associated with it. But when you look at effectiveness, meaning need for medication, recurrent or, um, office visits, and need for further surgeries, Holup definitely surpasses it within the second year after the procedure. And as you get out 15, 17, 19 years, there's no procedure that compares to Holup when it, you look at cost effectiveness uh, for the patient. And because Holup is so effective, I do quite a few Holups after failed previous procedures. So we looked at our patients who had undergone prior surgical procedures. Some of these people had undergone three to four BPH procedures before they got to me. And this is just a video of me removing the Eurolift clips from a patient. Um, and you can do a holeup in any scenario. I've done a holeup after PAE, Resume, Tuna, TUMT, Prostatic Eurolift, PVP, Green Light, whatever. And they all do extremely well. The only difference is, is that they are slightly higher risk of stricture disease or bladder neck contracture disease compared to someone who has not had prior surgeries, but they can expect the same good voiding outcomes. There are some patient populations that are very difficult to handle, and we've really been trying to come up with a good treatment strategy for them. Because holeup is so de-obstructing, I am able to actually use Botox in the bladder at the time of the surgery for patients who have prostate obstruction and severe urge with urge incontinence. So they have an overactive bladder, maybe a small capacity bladder, and they're obstructed. It's a very difficult scenario to deal with. Um, but what I will do in these patients is I will do the hole up and inject Botox at the same time of the procedure um, so that I can force their bladder to relax and to obstruct them. So we had 82 patients who had severe urge incontinence before surgery. 41 had a hole up with Botox and 41 just had a hole up. So we compared their outcomes at three months. There was no worse outcomes in the Botox group. Patients were able to urinate. There was no increased rate of failure to void, no increased rate of retention, but they were much, much happier than the patients who just had 
um, the whole of the loan because their symptom scores have reduced significantly much quickly, much more quickly than if we had just deobstructed them. So it's a helpful adjunct in patients with urgent continence. I also am doing a lot of what we call urgent or emergent holdups. I get patients transferred in from other tertiary care centers to my hospital because they have these massive prostates that they can't manage that are bleeding. Holup works great for this. So we looked at um, seven men who were transferred in last year. And they had a mean prostate size of 213 cc's. 71% were on anticoagulation that they could not stop. And I took them to the OR for bleeding. Mean OR time was 98 minutes. And their pre-op mean length of stay was 4.8 days. After surgery, we were able to get them out within two days. Um, almost all of them were discharged without a catheter. And all of them were voiding spontaneously at six months follow-up. So it is great for those patients. Some of these patients had failed PAE, like they had really difficult situations that could not be managed. Well, I've told you why Holup is so great, but what is happening in the marketplace? Well, we looked at the National Ambulatory Surgery Sampling Database and found that from 2016 to 2019, TERPs have gone up. So they went from about 62% of the marketplace to 90% in 2019. The whole up also doubled in that time from 4.7% to 8.3%. So we know that the physicians want to do this. We know that the patients want it. Interestingly enough, PVP almost dropped off completely. We're seeing that the poor outcomes with this procedure is leading to physicians and patients to look for other options. And simple prostatectomy has stayed constant. I would say the biggest criticism of Holup is adoption. The initial cost of the laser and the morselator, those can be overcome because I know hospitals can see what kind of money they will make if the surgeon does this. But really it's the steep learning curve. We lack hands-on courses and training programs. I think we're getting a lot better especially with the models, but we're not quite there yet. And we don't have a standardized curriculum. And then patient, uh, physicians feel really excited after a course. They want to do it. They're naively and confident. Then they do a case and then they get really discouraged. And then they don't always have that push to keep going after that bad initial case so that they can master it. It takes about 20 cases for an experienced surgeon fully supervised to get to a point where they can do it by themselves. It's about 50 plus cases for the inexperienced surgeon to just get through it. To be really good, you need at least 100. So to just be very good to tackle the big prostates, to be efficient, you need 100. You can get through it around 20 to 50, depending on your experience level. When you're first starting out, I say look at 80 to 110 gram prostates. The smaller prostates have much more difficult planes. They're difficult to find. If they're too big, you get lost in the adenoma. 80 to 110 is the sweet spot. You want a normal BMI. Morbidly obese patients are extremely difficult to treat with Holup. And to limit bleeding, you wanna avoid chronic catheterization, avoid chronic infections and prostatitis. Those prostates bleed more. The surgeon needs to be doing one to two cases a week, and they need support from their department or um, group. You know, they need to know they're going to be slower in the OR. They need the referrals to get these 80 to one gram, uh, 110 gram prostates. And then when they're choosing a case, they need to think about the anatomy. So this is a, an example of a patient who has a 336 gram prostate. You can see that most of the adenoma is in the bladder. It's kind of filling up the bladder. And this is another one that's a 230 gram prostate and there's very little adenoma extending into the bladder. It's all kind of tucked up behind the bladder. Well, at first glance, you might say, well, I'll take the smaller prostate. It'll be much easier. But in reality, the smaller prostate is a much harder case because most of the tissue is tucked up behind the bladder. You have to dig it out and then deposit it into the bladder. Whereas in the larger case, it's mainly a median lobe and it easily deposits in. So look for median lobes, look for adenoma that's more into the bladder than behind it, and that will make it easier as well. 
So I've talked a long time and I'm going to conclude here, but I just want to let you know that whole up outcomes are basically similar to a simple prostatectomy, but you have the faster recovery time with fewer complications. The retreatment rate is very low, even at 18 years follow-up. Improvements in equipment and technique have allowed for HOLUP to be performed as a day case with same-day catheter removal. And HOLUP is ideal for the difficult scenario patients, in-stage bladder, bleeding, failed prior or prior procedures or surgeries, they do great. However, the learning curve is steep and it can be overcome, but it's gonna take a lot of support for that surgeon to get through that steep learning curve. So thank you, and thank you again for having me. Have a good day. Richard Wolf, Spirit of Excellence.